Well, hello there, and you join us here today to talk to someone who's doing something a little bit different in the watchmaking space. They've seen what everyone else is doing and they've thought, no, we're going to do it our own way. This is H. Moser. Tom, we, we talk about Moser quite frequently because of all the crazy different things that are going on. Um, but I wondered if we could bring someone else into the mix who could share from their perspective. Tom, do you think that's a good idea? Oh, yeah. What are you thinking? CEO, VIP? <laughs> I think so. I think so. Um, Edward, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Andrew. Thank you for having me. For those people who have been living under a whole pile of rocks the last few decades, why don't you tell us who you are and why you're here talking to us about Moser? So oh, you introduced me briefly, but uh, yeah, Edouard Melon is uh, is my name. Uh, born in the Vallée de Joux, so one in uh, one of the uh, hubs of traditional high-end Swiss watchmaking. Um, I have a few generations of, of watchmakers behind me. Uh, my father worked for one of a of the big brands uh, out there in the Vallée de Joux for many years. He actually worked for a few brands. He worked for Cartier, for JLC, but then many years for for AP. And um, and yeah, we I'm I'm an engineer by um, by education. I did a master in engineering. Then I did an MBA in the US. And with my family, we took over Moser in 2012. So a little bit more than 10 years now. And um, that's probably the reason why you want me to uh, to be here and, <laughs> and 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 give some insights. And I've been actually CEO of, uh, of H. Moser since um, uh, almost 10 years, because I think it was March 2013 that I took that role. Yeah, so I'm going to hazard a guess that if we have any questions about Moser, you're probably the guy to talk to about it. Now, the thing that's always been impressed upon me about Moser is that Moser says, we're going to make this thing. So take the Swiss Alp watch. It's a rectangular movement in a very specific case size, almost just done just because. And I know how difficult it is just to create a normal round movement. So that's the engineering side, but you've brought an artistry to it as well, I think. From the other end of the scale, uh, in fact, we, we recently visited um, Art in Time, so a retailer in Monaco, and they have a selection of Moser pieces there, and we were utterly blown away. Uh, and I don't know if you have a name for the specific dial, but the dial on the, um, the Pioneer Mega Cool that just explodes with light, which whichever direction you look at it. So where did you find the inspiration for the business with regards to the aesthetic? Well, as I, as I mentioned, I think the, there were a lot of things that were there. And the first thing that I did was trying to, um, to see what, what to keep and what to, uh, to um, let go, so to say. Mm -hmm. And um, the first thing we did was a simple slide when I was doing a kind of an analysis I mean I, I like to analyze and maybe I'm a bit Cartesian there but we did an analysis of what we had in terms of aesthetics um, I like to use other brands and for example Breguet you know you have the hands you have like uh, the the specificities on, on the side of the of the case you have like uh, the, the certain type of dial so I always took Breguet as kind of, a, of an example of a round watch that has a lot of aesthetics that are very specific so yeah. for me it was important for Moser to identify what would be the key elements that we should identify as being Moser. And um, back in 2012, and until back to, to 2012, we had a lot of very round watches uh, in white gold or rose gold with silver dials or black dial. But there was one particular model which was made of palladium. It's what they call at that time the gray fumé dial. And uh, and that was one of the elements that really was, I would say, essential to the future of Moser was to say, well, out of those hundreds of SKUs that they had at that time. There was this one, which, which was fairly different because any of the other, and we did the exercise, we removed the logo on the other watches and then put it next to a Calatrava, a Patrimony, a, a Jules Audemars, and they all look very similar. You couldn't really identify, but <laughs> back then we didn't have a Royal Oco or Nautilus to, uh, to, to create something that is truly different for our brand. So we had to work with round watches. So that's where the Fumé dial became kind of the cornerstone of what we really did uh, in very early is trying to starting to play with colors. And then we we played on on the side of the cases to say like all our watches should have like free forms on the side. Like it's not it's really three dimensional cases. Um, so we want in all collections to work really the side of the cases and not have uh, flat um, elements. The shape of the hands came also to, to us. Then we look at the logo when everybody was trying to go towards like capital letters because it's more, it makes it more luxury, reduce, keep, give away like the and sons and company and whatever. 
we uh, we said let's let's skip the very traditional Moser logo and not follow what all agencies were telling us like you need to revamp your logo because it makes us different. And uh, and slowly we we found our way and. Um, at the same time, as I said in the beginning, we have we had the chance to have the perpetual one, which was for me like the cornerstone of the technical uh, design, which was all about making complex watches look very simple. I wanted every Moser watch to look like a three hands watch. So combining those few elements of aesthetics with this philosophy on on the on the movement side kind of defined the elements uh, that we needed or the codes that we needed for every future developments at Moser. This sounds more like a conversation, like a, a creative direction conversation for a modern tech brand, almost. It's a very similar mentality with the strategic and pragmatic and very different to what I've seen in a lot of other watchmakers, which is we create and it will be what it will be. Breguet is a great example of that, I think. Um, how, how do you bring that different mindset? Where does that come from? I think from from day one we said you know we we are a small brand we need to be different and uh, not only in what we our, on our, our output but also on the way we work and we we decided we said early on that our culture should be of a of a 200 years old startup so very like creative open minded uh, innovation driven like throwing ideas at each other uh, bouncing ideas and and being honest about what's good and what's not and um, it's funny in many cases i sat down on forums next to uh, the the big ceos of these industries and many are are complaining that they said oh we would love to do what moza does but we can't and i said well why can't you i mean uh, Apple, who is way bigger, uh, is very innovative and creative, but it's it's a philosophy, it's a culture that you need to create around that. So I think you're right. I mean, we we kind of came in and, and kind of said, you know, there's no way we can compete based on budgets. So we need to compete based on creativity and, and innovation. And the only way to do that is by, you know, being very open minded, trying to find and grab ideas from here and there. And if you do it alone in your office and you know close your door, it doesn't work. So it's really about building a team around you of people you trust, and um, also an experience that I learned from my previous experience, where unfortunately uh, it it failed. Uh, being an entrepreneur uh, is that you, you yeah you need a few people around you uh, who can be honest to you and say like listen you're gonna screw up, so you need to that that doesn't work. You need to uh, and they need to be confident and and direct enough to to come to you and tell you that. So if you can build a team around you. Who, uh, who is like that, then uh, I think you can win. And that's what we did. Most of the people that work with me today were there 10 years ago. And, uh, and there's a lot of trust and, and, uh, and I would say, um, well, proud, pr pride because of what we ach achieved. But also everybody has, has the, um, the possibility and, and the willingness to, to, to bring his uh, or her input in the, in the process. Yeah, I, th I think that's really interesting. Um, th that was, that was going to be one of my questions that you, you sort of touched on there was, what does a brand do that's coming into its tricky 200th year in business? Um, like, what are the goals for a brand as that? And, and, and as you say, it's, you know, pulling ideas from all over and having a strong team. What, what, what's the process like when someone, you know, brings ideas to the table that are as mad as some of the things you put out, like cheese and Vanta Black and all these sorts of things? Is that, are there like these anything goes kind of brainstorming me meetings at Moza? That's that's the typical where we have workshops that we do on a regular basis where we throw those ideas. We have, uh, I, can, I wish I could show you, maybe you can see it here, like on my door, you see all those post-its. These are like the kind of, of sessions where we just throw ideas and then we, we take them off and then uh, along the years we uh, we implement them or not. And we're very democratic. Again, if uh, if somebody has a very strong mind, mindset and saying, usually it's a lot, it's a few people. And usually it's me like that has a crazy idea and the others are like, ah, you know, maybe not this time. And then, and then I'm... I'm <laughs> Usually, usually I would listen, uh, but not always, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but uh, but no, it's it's also like I said, as the role as a CEO is also to kind of set a vision, long term ideas, and then bring the impulse. Like people bring projects, and then we say, okay, let's do it, and then push behind and say, hey, you know, we wanted to do this. Where do we stand? Um, and I think uh, as we go, the more it, it is this way, and and said we're reaching 200 years so we always have new projects new ambitions and we have more and more um, means also to our ambitions in the beginning it was i would say if i look just from a product standpoint um in the beginning we we we, we did a lot of revamping so it was like new dials or re-engineering of the same movement and then suddenly we started developing a new movement and then help also from external friends to to do something new and now we are in processes where we're looking at projects that are 
five years ahead. I mean, 2028 is our 200 years anniversary and we have big projects. We like, you know, uh, today Moser is known for amazing uh, simple complications or simple single complications. They're not simple, uh, but I think multi complications, uh, grand complications are the next step for a brand like ours if we want to be we, we might never be, but to, to be able to compare certain of our products with the Grande Complication from the, the Patek, the Lange, the AP, the Vacheron of this world, um, we need to get there, but in the Moser way. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's... Sounds exciting. Yeah. I mean, that could mean literally anything, couldn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, if you read the codes of Moser, it could be... It couldn't be anything. It has to... I mean, there's just certain things, right? There's... You look at the perpetual, you look at the chrono. Again, as what I said, like everything at the center, it has to be, it looks simple, but yet complicated. So there's, it could be any, everything, but it has, for me, it's important that it follows these few codes that we have established. So maybe we can put that together as a little bit of an equation so I can reverse engineer your thinking to help me understand the future. So you mentioned that every year you do something unusual, something that has a statement. For last year, was the Genesis that piece? Uh, yeah, we try. I mean, as we, you mentioned, the, uh, I mean, there was the Swiss Alp watch, then the Swiss Mad watch, then there was the Swiss Icon watch, the Moser Nature watch, there yep. was the collaboration with Max, there was yep. uh, the uh, Second Second, there was the um, Vanta Black piece, the No Hands. So it's not every year at the same date. It used to be every year at the same date, but then suddenly we got too many ideas, so we made a, a, a few more every year. I'm actually creating a... a a box uh, with, I think it's 12 watches, which are like the 12 iconic crazy pieces we have uh, we have developed. So maybe one day I, I can show oh, that to you. Oh, wow. Yeah, we would love to get our hands on that. Uh, the last one to date is uh, is the Genesis project. Uh, that was uh, also one very, uh, I would say, uh, probably one of the most complicated to implement uh, project. Uh, and like the others, very polarizing. Not everybody understood. A lot of people stop at the visual of the watch and don't look at what's behind it but that's what's fun about it i love to open small windows and see how many people go through the windows to look what's behind it and uh, those who just look at the windows said oh my god this is so stupid <laughs> well you've you've often in the past challenged the industry um but now it seems like you're almost challenging your own audience if you like it's kind of very meta which is probably in keeping with the whole nft digital web 3 type of uh, point of view now, I, I was, from my perspective, the watch itself, I thought the use of 3D printing in the case, like that has so much potential. The interesting three-dimensionality with the crystal, again, visually speaking, I thought that was incredible. Uh, where I struggled a little bit was with uh, the Web3, NFT, all of that kind of thing. Tell me a bit about your thinking there. Yeah. Well, the, the whole idea is about how the, the business has evolved. Uh, in the recent years. And it's all, I mean, the, the watch business used to be very transactional. You sell a watch and then you service it. Okay. And then, uh, well, you own it and you give it to the next generation. I don't think a lot of people keep it for the next generation as they see the big profit coming and they resell the watch, <laughs> etc. So they, we, we, we run into a, a change in the, in, the, in the business where the secondary market became very, very important. And we have, I wouldn't say, Hands, but we have a lot of emails every day of people saying, oh, I want to buy, buy this watch or I want to sell this watch or what's the value? Can you tell me when it was serviced? Can you tell me who, do you know the guy who is selling it? Can I have uh, information about the number? That's a lot of work for us. And we were thinking, you know, how the value of our products, the secondary market is about transparency, is about insurance, is about reducing the risk in those transactions and how can we do it? And that's where what blockchain uh, enabled to, uh, to I think, this industry and, and other industries is to bring a lot of kind of certified uh, information about authenticity, where it's coming from, who is the person behind. And that's why we wanted to implement a lot of elements that would protect uh, all the, the owners and future owners of Moser watches. So that's why we we started working with the with the Aura blockchain. We started implementing certification. We started in, in implementing also an, an insurance because an insurance, I believe, especially uh, an insurance like this one, which is uh, you got your watch stolen, you lose it, whatever, you get uh, reimbursed, is a lot of value to the to the, the the customer. Of course, as we always do with Moser, we want to have also. Um, some symbolic elements so if we play with web3 why not create a metaverse and why not create an nft art because that's fun we created the time capsule for example which uh, documents the birth of your watch 
I don't know, in, in 100 years from now, when this watch is traded for to somebody else, maybe somebody will have fun looking at the watchmaker Martina up here, like putting the last screw and seeing the, the escapement of that particular watch, knowing that it's it was on the 24th of February 2023 at 10.36 uh, 36 and 45 seconds AM here in Schaffhausen with the Schaffhausen Nachrichten, which is the local newspaper in my hands and say, well, I, I am currently the CEO. Who, who knows who's going to be the, 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 the CEO at that time, or even if Moser is still going to be there. As a collector, I would appreciate that. So we thought, you know, we bring value to the people, uh, to the owners, to our products, protecting more security, more transparency. For me, that's a lot of value to, to the community. And I think it's a responsibility of the brands to do that. I think the, the journey of a watch starts at the moment where we sell it. It's not the end of it. A lot of brands see the end of the journey was once they have produced, they have created it, they have produced it, they have put it in display. It's been sold to the customer. Okay, it might come back for service, but it's pretty much I've done my job. I think that's where our job starts, and I'm trying to bring as many tools as possible with a pilot, very polarizing product, as you said, which I personally love. I was wearing it today for a photo shoot. I I, I like the design. I think it's very Minecraft. Maybe you know I've younger kids i see my my uh, my kids on on all those uh, things like playing and I, I find it cool but i think the most important for me is what can we do with the technology a lot of things will evolve in the years to come but i think the responsibility is to explore how to protect our owners and future owners protect the value of our product bring security and transparency and that's what we're trying to do with all those nfts and and blockchain uh, technology i think Unfortunately, there was a, a lot of bad press around NFTs in the last few months and yeah, the banks, bankruptcy, and but the technology is there. And I believe it will add a lot of value uh, for those who recognize it. And, and, and to be honest, we got so many requests for this watch. We were totally oversold. Uh, we're going to create two amazing products um, because it's part of a triptych. The next one will be something that a lot of people will wish they get. And then the, the last one would probably be something that uh, is, my idea would be to create it with the owners and like to create something together uh, with the 50 uh, owners of the of the first Genesis. And yeah, and I think it's, it's these are people who believe in and understand what we're trying to do. And uh, I, would, I look forward to working with them. If I can take an interpretation from that, I think it's really good that as a brand, you're acknowledging the life after sale. Because, um, least of all, we, we being Watchfinder, pre-owned watches, etc. There's a lot of traditional brands. This goes back to the very genesis of what genesis of what we were talking about with Moser, which is challenging the norms that aren't actually in the best interest of the customers. The in-house business, um, the, the speed of development, how things look, how things are incorporated with the customer input. And a lot of these traditional brands insist that a watch is purchased and then lives with its owner forever. And even with the, the greatest of collectors who's most into watches, they can't just continually amass a pile ad infinitum. They, they will choose to sell some things. Yeah, I mean, those brands even uh, pre uh, ask them not to sell them. They, pre they prevent it. They try really to fight against people <laughs> reselling the watches. Of course, you don't want too much speculation. But again, yeah. bringing more transparency helps. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, as we wrap up, because we're, we're just almost out of time, Care to drop any little hints as to what we might be expecting in 2023? Ah, a lot of things. Uh, I, to be honest, if we if we talk about something crazy, I'm not yet sure. We have a few ideas, but I don't know which one we might implement. But in terms of more like the traditional things, I mean, we're launching in a couple of weeks. We'll have a nice perpetual calendar for most or something. I think one of my dream watches um, uh, in the Endeavor collection. Uh, really looking forward to launching this one. There's a there's a very emotional link towards this particular watch because of the material we're using. If you've seen some of our previous interviews, so you probably uh, know which material. I mean, my first watch I received when I was 18 was in a special material from AP. Uh, so this one we finally get to bring to the market, which was my dream almost since we started with Moser, but it's a material that is very difficult to work with. Then we have, um, what do we have? Uh, we have a new color for the Streamliner. We're stopping the, the Green Dragon in 2000 and, and at the end of 2022, we're still delivering a few, the few that are late because of late de deliveries of certain components. And then we'll have just for 2023, a special color that we will be revealing just after Watches and Wonders, I think, uh, which is quite nice. It's very different uh, from the Green Dragon. It's another animal out there. Uh, that's another hint. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and then what else we have? Uh, we have a new movement. I hope we can, we have two actually. We have a module that we have developed um, with, uh, with Agenor, which is very, very cool, uh, a calendar. They're getting very, very good at calendars and we're working with them on there. And I hope we can bring it towards uh, September and we have uh, something completely internal, which is a smaller, thinner, very nice new movement. <laughs> We're also bringing slowly new codes in our movements for the sport watches compared to the traditional. The streamliner perpetual calendar we brought, like the the, the movements is more, it's darker than the tradi the, the the chrono. So we're yeah. slowly shifting for the sport watches or the the steel cases uh, like Pioneer and Streamliner towards dark ray movements, and we keep the traditional Endeavor and Heritage with the light gray movement. So we're kind of creating two codes within our codes um and and slowly more uh, bringing a little bit more opening in the movements i mean we started learning how to work with skeletons uh, a couple of years ago and now we implemented it in the skeleton cylindrical tourbillon last year which we referred to as winning the grand prix genève uh, in the tourbillon category last year uh, so we continue to explore like bringing a little bit more like we used to be really like three quarter bridges type of uh, movements. We try to, to open them a little bit more now. Yeah. And that's something that you will see as an evolution. And that's why also there's only one color for the streamliner this year, because we are in a mutation and we wanted to have like a 2023 a year where we do something different, special to be able to bring something else in 2024. Cool. <laughs> Had enough <laughs> tips? You are ridiculously oh, and, and, busy. And, and, oh, sorry. my goodness. And, and we're bringing a smaller <laughs> Yeah, smaller. Yeah, somebody, a lot of people have been asking me for a smaller version of one of our iconic uh, uh, product, and it's not the streamliner. And uh, and that's something we had long discussion within the team. I have the smallest wrist in the in the team, so everybody in the beginning said, "Oh no, we need a bigger one. We need a bigger one." And now they all realize that I was right. Always right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us and being candid and, you know, taking uh, taking all the questions. Honestly, I, I do find Moza to be one of the most exciting brands that's out there. Like You guys could be relied upon for consistently doing things that grab my attention. And uh, long may that continue before the rest of Switzerland <laughs> finally eats your bones. Um, this uh, has been a, a fascinating conversation. And Div, you're a listener. If we ever to have Edward on again, what would you ask him? Post your comments uh, down below and we'll see if we can fire them at him. Thank you very, very much. Really, really appreciate it. And um, hopefully we'll get to have many more conversations in the future. Uh, Divya and listener, please do like, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>